Welcome to Office Hours. I'm Rich Goldstein, and I'm here to answer your patent and trademark questions live every week. Uh, you can join the Zoom webinar to ask your questions. If you're on Facebook, then click the link in the post to be invited to join us and ask your questions. I'm going to jump right in here with a question submitted to me ahead of time. What's the maximum recommended time gap for filing a provisional patent application after having completed the prior art research? Can this be any time really, months or years even? That's an excellent question. And the answer is that there's no specific time when you might consider the research to be stale so that it needs to be redone to be accurate. Uh, of course, the longer you wait, the greater the possibility that someone else is going to have a similar idea and that some similar um, idea might come out in prior art that can be used against you. So the simple answer is it could be any time, but the risk continues as the time goes by. So the sooner the better. Okay, so now if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We do this every Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can click the link in the post to be invited to join us on the Zoom so that you could ask me anything about patents and trademarks. Um, now let's get to some more questions. Uh, first, let's talk about some ground rules. Uh, this is not legal advice. This is for educational purposes. And let me explain the difference. So uh, a lot of times when we're talking about concepts in patent law, uh, if I hear a certain set of facts, if I hear a certain circumstance, I might have one answer, one answer that explains how the uh, situation is or what the, what the, um, you know, what the answer is. Um, but then when I hear a, a little bit more about the question, when I get uh, a bit more information, um, it may be that I have an opposite answer. And so really legal advice only comes and should only come after having the full set of circumstances, after, after someone is aware of everything going on in your world, in your situation, and then they can give you um, a specific answer, real legal advice. So just to be clear, this is not legal advice. This is for educational purposes. And um, you can ask anything that you like, but what I ask is for you to not put in anything that's confidential. Don't share any confidential information in the question itself. Don't tell me about your idea. So um, when you ask the question, the question will go directly to me. But still, as I said, uh, we don't want confidential information included in that question itself. So, okay. Um, and to ask a question, just go to the bottom of the screen where it says uh, Q&A. And if you click that pane, if you, if you click the Q&A um, kind of question block, um, it'll give you the ability to type a question in that will go directly to me. And again, I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer your question. Um, so let's see, um, let's get to some other questions here. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, what, um, you know, what is prior art? I, mean, I think it's a little bit of a confusing question there, but basically I think um, reading through what they're asking is like, what can be used against you in considering if your idea is new or not? So in general, prior art are the things that could be used against you in considering whether your idea fits the requirements for, for patentability. So um, there are a bunch of different categories um, at, under the patent laws of what qualifies as prior art, but in general, it can be patents. Um, in other words, an actual issued patent that describes a similar idea. Um, it can be publications, whether that's a, a magazine article or some type of online um, post or discussion that describes what the idea is, uh, could be what's called a patent application publication, which means someone applied for a patent, it got published, but they didn't actually get the patent. That could be used against you as well. And um, it also could be um, things that happen in public, like public use of your product. Um, and, uh, um, you know, public use, having the invention out there in public on sale, like things that came before your invention are considered prior art. And 
um, there's some technical rules about what qualifies, what can actually be used against you. Uh, but really the whole name of the game is to get in there before, um, to get in there before the date of any of those prior art references. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, when we are about to file a patent application, as we, as we discussed a moment ago, in answer to that other question, um, you know, we want to do some research to see what's in the prior art, see what's out there. But of course, prior art is issuing all the time. There's always new prior art that's coming out. Um, and of course, um, any day that you get your application in sooner means that there's less things that could be used against you. So, you know, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, it pays to get your application filed as soon as reasonably possible. Um, and and uh, just further elaboration to an early question, hey, it's sometimes possible that you could be working on something for years and you file a patent application and, and there isn't any prior art that's come out in the years that you've been working on it, and that's great. So it really didn't work against you um, to delay the process to be ready to file. But in many cases, it does. I mean, in many cases, I... Um, you know, I see prior art that came out just before we filed the application. Um, and uh, in some cases we can get around it, in other cases we can't. So, so the simple answer for all of that is the sooner the better. Um, again, if you wanna ask a question, just put it below in the Q&A pane, click that and ask me whatever your question is, just don't include any confidential information. Okay, so let's see what else we have here. Um, okay, um, that's a very general question. I'm going to, I'm going to loop back around to it later. Um, but here's, um, let's go with this one. Um, how do you determine if your idea is eligible for a patent? Um, that's a really great question. And there's a few different levels to what makes something eligible. Um, so I'm going to stick to, you know, Okay, we all know that for something to be patentable, it has to be different than things that exist. And there's a whole bunch to say about that. Um, but let's not address that portion of eligibility. Let's look at specifically subject matter eligibility. Eligible meaning is it the right type of thing to be patented? Um, so in order to get a patent, it, um, th there's four categories of things that are eligible for patent. Um, one is called a machine, a manufacturer, a composition of matter, and a process, okay? So the first three are rather physical. Um, machine is something that has um, working parts, moving parts that interact with each other. They don't necessarily, traditionally it was considered moving parts for a machine, but it could also be something which doesn't have moving parts, but it's parts that interact with each other, like an electric circuit where they're not actually moving components, but each component is sending energy to the other components in a way that then has the circuit provide a function. So that's a machine. A manufacturer is something that's one piece, but it has a function, like, um, like a paperclip. It's a piece of wire that's bent in a unique way that gives it functionality. That's considered a manufacturer. Um, and then, Third is composition of matter. Composition of matter is, is a combination of chemicals, essentially. So that could be a hair care product that has four different ingredients, or it could be a pharmaceutical. Um, it could be basically any type of composition of, of different ingredients, different chemicals. So that's composition of matter. Um, and then the last category is a process. And traditionally, a process applied to things like manufacturing procedures, manufacturing processes, like where there was a new process for refining steel, where the product itself wasn't any different, the, the end result wasn't any different, the steel that got created wasn't necessarily different, but the process maybe was more efficient. And the process had a series of steps, like heating the iron ore to a certain temperature and then um, adding a certain additive in, cooling it to a certain point for a certain length of time, whatever, just a, a series of steps. And that's what got protected as a process. But then in the last couple of decades, 
it's expanded where process now includes things like computer software and apps. And so the thing that gets protected there is the process, how the software goes about producing the result. Um, it's about those steps that take place um, in that method, in the method that's being carried out by the software, by the app that gets protected. So um, in terms of if something's eligible, I think that's what you're getting at there is like, is it the right type of thing? Um, and of course, the, you know, the wrong type of thing are things that are not physical or processes like this, such as branding, like branding, a logo, the name for a product. That's, a, that's the subject matter for a trademark. Um, so if you're talking about basically the idea for a physical product or, or a process in which the, how the product is made or a software or an app, then you're talking about uh, a patent. If you're talking about branding, then you're talking about a trademark. Okay, so let's see. Um, the next question. Um, okay, is it possible to patent an idea that uses a prior art idea, but in such a way that in order to achieve the new idea, the prior art concept needs to be used or applied twice so that the required result is achieved? Okay. Um, and then there's a bit more to the question about um, an example. I don't know if the example really um, adds much to the discussion, but let me, let me put it to you this way. The, the limiting factor here is obviousness. So if you're going to, uh, normally you would say, okay, if an idea is out there, then the idea of repeating it is probably obvious. So like, um, you know, if the concept or the process for waxing an automobile using a certain type of wax, for example, if that's well known, and then you say, all I'm going to do is like, I'm going to say we do it twice. You do it twice, you get better results. Now that's probably obvious because people uh, in the field, people generally know that, um, that repeating something or repeating a process might give you better or cleaner results. It's kind of like if it was a, you know, a cleaning solution, if you were, um, you know, if you sprayed on some type of cleaning product onto a surface and you wiped it down, um, it's pretty well known that if you want to be extra careful, you want to get it to be extra clean, you spray it and you do it again. So under ordinary circumstances, um, the thing that would stop you there is not just the, the sheer repetition, but it's the, um, um, but it's the fact that it's probably obvious to re repeat something to get finer results. Um, but of course, if there's something unexpected about the result, if there's something, if there's some reason why people wouldn't ordinarily think to do it twice, um, like maybe that usually if you did it twice, you lose the benefit of the first time you did it. And so people wouldn't ordinarily think to do it twice, but then you do, and there's an unexpected result. So I think the answer to your question is in, um, if there is an unexpected result, uh, then that might point to the fact that it's not really obvious. Um, and if there's a reason why you wouldn't want to do it twice, um, then that in itself, the process itself becomes unexpected. And that could be unobvious. Um, uh, duh, duh, duh. So um, yeah, and then follow-up question you asked about repeating existing patent twice, Richard. Um, the existing patent needs to be used twice at the same time. Uh, and the unexpected result makes the product stronger. So exactly, yeah, the, then, then if it makes the product stronger and people wouldn't ordinarily think to do it twice at the same time like this, there's something unobvious about it, then it could be eligible for patent. But that's really, that's exactly the, in, the issue there. It's one of obviousness, is would this be something that people in the field would think to do? Maybe they haven't done it, but, um, you know, if... Um, if it's, if it's not, if it's, if there's something unexpected to it, then it could be non-obvious. And, you know, as we know, non-obvious leads to patentable in order for something to be patentable, it would need to be non-obvious. Um, and you mentioned, yep, there's another follow-up there. Um, they've not thought about it because it would be out on the market now. Um, that, that raises a, a really interesting, um, principle about non-obviousness. 
So first of all, when we submit a patent application, the, um, the examiner is going to have an opinion about the, um, um, is, is going to have opinion, an opinion about the obviousness or non-obviousness about your product. They're going to look at it and say, yeah, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, uh, or they'll say it's not obvious at all and let's allow the patent. In response, there are a bunch of things that we can do. If the patent examiner is calling it obvious, um, we could submit direct arguments about the, um, um, the, the things that the examiner is using to, to point to the obviousness. But we could also do something um, known as um, you know, secondary factors or, um, or I'm submitting arguments about secondary considerations. And so an example of a secondary consideration is that there is a long felt need. So it's something that people have been struggling with for a very long time. And if it had been so obvious, then people would have done it already. So pretty much what you say, that's what we call a secondary consideration argument. It's not directly attacking the, you know, the, um, the logic that these things would be readily combinable, but that, hey, you know, if it was so obvious, someone else would have done it. And uh, this is part of the dance of, of obviousness versus non-obviousness. And when we apply for a patent of, of convincing the patent office examiner that something really is not obvious is looking toward those factors sometimes, looking towards those real world considerations. Because a lot of times when they consider things at the patent office, it's more academic like you might talk to a person who's actually in the field of this manufacturing process, for example, and they can tell you like, no, I would have never thought of that, you know, for these reasons, like people don't ordinarily think to do that. And that's very useful for us to then make arguments like that and show the examiner that, okay, they're just looking at it rather academically. Like, okay, here's invention A that's in, the, in this field. Here's invention B that's in the same field. And then they make the conclusion it would be obvious to someone in the field to put them together. Without really having a, a, an educated feel for what someone in the field would do and what they would think to put together. So yes, absolutely. It could be very, very helpful to know that type of information. Okay, let's see, what, what else, what's next here? Um, how long does it take to get a patent? Well, typically, um, um, if you're applying for United States patent, you're applying for utility patent, it takes about two years on average to get a patent, let's say maybe one and a half to two and a half years of most cases will fall within that range. Um, if it's a design patent, it takes a little bit less time, maybe more like a year. Um, and part of, part of the consideration though is how smoothly things go. Often it takes about a year to a year and a half for the application to be reviewed for the very first time by an examiner. And once they review it, they may uh, initially approve the patent application in which case you'll have the patent within a few months once you pay the issuance fees, um, or they might reject it, uh, in which case we have some time to submit a response to the rejection and argue for it to be approved. And obviously then the process takes a bit longer. So it takes typically a couple of years to get a patent. Um, but one thing though you wanna have your attention on is getting your application filed as soon as possible. Um, and most of the time when you're working with m most patent attorneys that have a, a caseload, have a docket, they're busy, you should expect at least a few months to get the application prepared and filed. So if you're planning to launch the product, allow a few months at least f to have a, um, a patent attorney work on preparing the patent application for filing. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, so, um, yeah, th this is a general question, but maybe we'll get into it a bit here. Um, three things I'd like to know about is, th is the process, time, and cost. Okay, that covers a lot of ground there. Kind of like, what is the process? 
um, what is the the time that it takes and what's the cost so we we just address the the time so in general though the process is that we want to prepare a patent application um, and then file it so the preparation of the patent application can take a few months and 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 what we're doing there is preparing everything that you see when you look at a patent so anytime you've ever looked at a patent and you see the the description that's present you see the drawings that are present that was all done in preparing the patent application so there's a good amount of work there and it takes some time um, but once that's filed then it it gets assigned to an examining group at the patent office gets assigned to an examiner eventually and the examiner will review the patent application and either approve it or reject it um, if they reject it then they will send the reasons for their rejection and you'll have an opportunity to really review what they're saying and whether there are arguments to be made to convince the examiner to approve the patent and very often that's the case very often we receive a rejection and it's pretty clear that we just need to present the right arguments and we should be able to get it approved and once the application is approved, they provide what's called a notice of allowance. And, and once the notice of allowance is issued, then you have three months to pay certain issuance fees. And once those issuance fees are paid, then the patent will actually be printed as a United States patent. And I have one over here. Yeah, okay, a second. This one just came in. I, just, I opened it already. It's in the envelope. So here, United States patent. So once the patent is approved um, and you pay the ins issuance fees, then it issues as a United States patent. Um, and that's in a nutshell what the process is and the general timing. Um, in terms of the, the cost, it varies tremendously depending on who's, you know, who's helping you, who's, uh, who's representing you. Um, in general, I would say utility patent. If you're doing utility patent, it's gonna cost at least $10,000 software, probably closer to 20. Um, design patent though, just a few thousand dollars. Uh, design patent is a lot um, more straightforward, a lot easier to prepare. Um, and so it costs quite a bit less. Um, but yeah, I think that covers the overall of, of the process, the time and the cost. If you have a more specific question, then please just go ahead and ask and, and I'm happy to go into more detail about that. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, okay, um, so this is more about trademarks. Um, if Bamboo Kitchen is a trademarked brand name, can you still use Bamboo for any other trademarks like Bamboo, Bamboo Sport, Bamboo Outdoor, etc.? cetera? Um, if Bamboo alone was a registered trademark, can you then register the extended versions of it like Bamboo Kitchen, Bamboo Sport, etc.? cetera? Okay. So um, first of all, I, um, you know, this question was submitted ahead of time. So I just looked up, I don't see any trademarks for Bamboo Kitchen um, um, specifically. So I don't think this is a specific example. And again, as I said in the beginning, I'm not looking to give legal advice on a specific situation. So I'm taking this as just a hypothetical example, which is great. That's how we wanna handle things here. So the first thing to understand about this, about this question, about the situation, um, is that there's no trademark is in a vacuum. Um, it's not like uh, if Bamboo Kitchen was a trademark brand name, it's not like someone owns that phrase for any purposes. What they'll typically do is own that phrase for a specific type of product or service. So they might have Bamboo Kitchen registered for... Um, cutlery, let's say, for example, uh, like knives and forks. Um, and uh, then the question is, can you use Bamboo Kitchen for something else? I mean, if you wanted to have um, um, Bamboo Kitchen for, I don't know, um, gardening supplies, then you probably could. Because the, the test with not only trademark infringement, but when, but when you can get a trademark is likelihood of confusion. So if there isn't a likelihood that your use of Bamboo Kitchen would be confusing to a consumer um, that knows of the other Bamboo Kitchen, 
Like if they, if they would think that you're affiliated, then, it, then it's no good. You're not gonna get it registered and it could be a trademark conflict. But if there's no likelihood of confusion, then it's possible to get that mark registered. Um, and you know, a, a few other things to consider in that is like, first of all, um, bamboo kitchen, if you are actually selling bamboo kitchens, like um, let's say cabinets that were made from bamboo wood, you wouldn't be able to trademark it because that would be considered descriptive. You can't trademark a name that describes the actual product. But um, Bamboo Kitchen for gadgets like can openers and things like that, I mean, that, that are not made of bamboo, that are metal, let's say can openers, um, that's possible to trademark because you're not actually describing the product. You're maybe suggesting something. Bamboo Kitchen may be suggesting like a, a rural kitchen in Asia somewhere. And, and that's what most branding is based upon is a suggestion to the consumer, an association, but not a direct description. Okay. So now um, the second part of the, the question is, um, so the question is, if bamboo alone was a registered trademark, can you then register the extended versions of it like bamboo kitchen, bamboo sport, etc.? The answer is, again, it depends. Um, how prominent is that trademark? Um, and what field are you looking to sell products in? Um, if it was in the same field, let's say if bamboo was trademarked for kitchen cutlery, um, and then you wanted to, to register bamboo kitchen for cutlery, you probably can't do it. And again, it goes by the same principle, likelihood of confusion. If people knew of the, um, of the bamboo name for cutlery, and then they saw bamboo kitchen, they probably assumed that, hey, that's, that's an extension of the bamboo product line. That's affiliated with the same company. So you probably can. Um, but with most trademarks, you wanna get an opinion of someone who has handled a lot of trademarks of whether there's a likelihood of confusion, whether it's likely to be registrable. Uh, and usually that opinion should be an educated opinion. In other words, the opinion that they give after having researched to see what other people have uh, registered that's similar to, uh, you know, to what you have in mind doing. So um, you know, if you wanted to register Bamboo Sport, you wanna have research done about marks that are similar to that in your particular field of product. And then, uh, and then it becomes easier to make a determination of whether it's likely to be distinctive enough for you to then go ahead and register it. Okay, let's see what else. Um, again, if you have questions, you can put it in the Q&A pane at the bottom of the screen. Um, and um, um, question about post filing. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay, that's one. What are the options when you receive an office action from the United States Patent Office? Um, great, great question. Um, so first of all, the two major options with anything that you receive from the Patent Office is to move forward or to abandon it. So um, it, when you file the patent application, when your application is in progress, you, you're never stuck in the process. So it's always an option to abandon it if, for example, the patent no longer suits your purposes. Or if you look at the rejection in the office action and you think it's, um, it's not something you could really um, surpass, it's not something you can get over. So abandonment is always the major option, although it's not a, a pleasant option or the one we wanna take. Um, but the other major option then is to respond. And typically, if it's a first office action, the way we respond is with um, an amendment. Um, and um, amendment can mean that we're making changes to the claims in the patent application uh, or some other changes that are appropriate. And, and it could also mean submitting arguments where we're arguing against the rejection. So when we submit that amendment, um, then um, we, we could be um, making changes that get past the examiner's rejection. Um, we could be submitting arguments that, uh, 
that should show the examiner that the patent application should not have been rejected in the first place. And often what we're doing is a combination of the two, where um, making some changes which we think might, uh, might give it a better shot at going through while making arguments to show that with these, say, smaller changes, that the application should now be allowable. Um, you know, and uh, I don't want to say that we sometimes throw the examiner a bone with making a small change. It's not quite that, but it's more like we find something to, to indicate that is distinct and gets past the examiner's reasonings, but isn't so major that it actually limits you significantly in the scope of your patent protection. So sometimes we look for that thing that basically shows that it falls outside of the examiner's arguments, um, but it's not a major change. And then we submit arguments that show that that, um, that that small change in itself should be enough to make the patent allowable. So in general, that's how you respond to an office action. That's what the options are in response to an office action. Um, a lot of times then, if the patent is subsequently rejected, then um, we get what's called a final office action. Um, and when you get a final office action, it's not actually as final as it sounds. Um, so a final office action limits your options for responding. And to a, to a significant extent, it really means that if you want to continue further, you may need to pay an additional government filing fee to get them to give it another fresh look. So um, you might say that it's a way that the patent office limits how much examiner time an examiner will spend for the filing fee that you paid to the government. So they kind of cut it short and say, okay, we will consider it further, but you need to pay some additional fees. Um, so uh, again, final office action really isn't final in that respect. But then also when you do get a final office action, there are some other options, including appealing to a higher authority. And there are certain higher authorities that, um, um, that, you can appeal to under the right circumstances, including uh, the board. You know, so there's a board of experienced patent examiners that you then can appeal to, to, um, to go over the head, so to speak, of the examiner. Um, you could also um, appeal to, um, to court in certain um, instances. You could file a, an action in federal court to, um, to seek to overcome the rejection most of the time, you don't take it that far, but there are various options. Uh, but uh, I guess the point is, um, if you get a final office action, um, it limits your options for responding. You might need to pay an extra filing fee, um, but it actually opens up some options in terms of, of now you don't have to deal directly with that examiner. Um, you can appeal to some other forum. Okay, um, uh, and, and I got a follow-up question about the, um, the trademark question before. Um, the question is, can I trademark Apple, Nike, or Adidas brand names, for example, for kitchen or gardening products, even though these brands already exist in different fields? Um, great question, and quick answer is no, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Um, because those names are... Um, are um, coin terms or arbitrary terms. Um, basically, the strongest trademarks you can get are for words that don't mean anything in the English language, but they're made up. Um, and so actually Nike and Adidas is a, is a made up word. So they're a coin term. Apple is different. So I'll talk about Apple, Apple in, a, in a second. But Nike and Adidas, it's a made up word. Um, you can't use that for anything else because um, it's the strongest form of trademark you could have is a, a coin term. And there's no reason that someone would need to name their kitchen products Nike unless they were trying to ride on the coattails of, of Nike sneakers and sportswear and things like that. Um, so you just can't do that. And, and so another way to answer that is that the rules bend a bit when it comes to famous marks. So something that's really famous their mark will travel further out into other fields. 
So, you know, something like, uh, like Adidas, um, you know, Nike, um, McDonald's, the name will go, um, it, it's like beyond a mere mortal trademark. It's kind of like, uh, like a super hero, a super, <laughs> a, a, an immortal trademark is it has superpowers. Like it will go further beyond that specific field because it'll be easier for, um, for Nike to show that um, people would be confused if they saw um, Nike telephones. They would think that somehow it's endorsed by Nike. That's just how people naturally think. Um, and, and so um, Apple computers is not a coined term. It's not a made up word. It's a real word and Apple is a real thing. Um, but in association with computers and electronics, it's arbitrary, meaning before Apple associated um, the word Apple with electronics, no one ever put those two together. And so um, it's a very strong trademark for that reason. Um, because if you're a competitor, see, even going back 20 years, uh, if you are a competitor in the computer space, there's no reason you need to use the word Apple to describe anything about your product, unless you're trying to confuse people into thinking you're associated with Apple computer. So um, because it's an arbitrary term, um, that makes it a strong trademark, and it means that you're able to stop people from using it for anything remotely similar. Um, but again, it's all founded on that common sense likelihood of confusion test. And the more famous a mark is, the more powerful the protection is. Um, you know, but if you take something that's more um, kind of ordinary um, and uh, you... Um, you know, you may be able to use that trademark in a very different field. Um, so um, bad example with Appy, Nike or Adidas, but um, with less famous marks, like less household names, you have way more latitude to do something in a, in a different field. So, I mean, Trademarks, though, coexist even among famous brands like there's General Motors and there's General Electric. Um, and those trademarks have been coexisting for a very long time and people don't get confused with them. Um, and uh, but if General. Uh, let's leave it at that for that example. Don't want to get too hypothetical with it. It can get kind of crazy. But I will say that um, a mark can be so famous that you can't do anything remotely close. Like for example, McDonald's. If you wanted to sell McShoes, I guarantee you McDonald's trademark lawyers will be all over you because it kind of is true. Because um, McDonald's has been calling McAnything, you know, been labeling things Mc whatever for a very long time, we've come to see things that say Mc something as being associated with McDonald's. Um, so it's like, again, if someone came out with a pair of mixed shoes, you might think to yourself, you'd probably think to yourself like, hey, this is probably affiliated with McDonald's. So they can extend that trademark even outside of the word McDonald's into other kind of words that root in Mick, um, you know, to the extent to which they'd be confusingly similar. So, yeah, it, it can be taken to a pretty far degree. So uh, that's a good reason why you want to be careful about your notion of like, well, okay, I'm going to use this name, but it's in a different field. Maybe get an opinion on, on whether, whether that use is different enough before you go about and do it. Okay. Um, um, let's see. Um, it's, it's a time we have there, three or four. Um, another question. Um, that was submitted ahead of time, had to do with, wait, where'd it go? Okay, they're asking about a specific website. And I don't want to name it. Um, but basically, it says there's, there's a um, web-based poll service. Is that a patentable idea? Um, and they're thinking of an existing website that has some type of polling service. Um, and so the question is, can we share ideas um, on polling services we intend to patent later on. I don't know what you mean by can we share out ideas on polling services we intend to patent later on. Um, but like, let me address the first part of it there. So I wouldn't, 
I, I wouldn't imagine that the idea of polling people um, as a service on the internet would be a patentable idea by itself. There can be some part of the process that is patentable, something specific, but like one of the things you want to consider is that when you zoom out on any given idea, you look at the big picture, fair chance you're not going to get the whole big picture um, the whole broad concept patented simply because there'll be prior art. There'll be other examples of it. There'll be other direct examples of something like that. And that will defeat your chance to, or your opportunity to preempt the whole market or the whole field. Um, but there also um, could be more specific examples of it that might get in the way of your process. And what you want to do then is zoom in a bit and say, well, what about your process makes it unique um you know is it like this potential workflow where we uh, we do this we ask certain types of questions and we use that to shape the questionnaire or maybe we um we have certain information about the users that are responding to the poll and we use that to shape what questions they're getting maybe somewhere in that process there could be something that that's patentable um and in that case that's what you'd want to look more specifically at. So you want to look more specifically about what makes your process, what makes your app, what makes your software um, distinctive. And then we want to look at the patentability of that. Most of the time, the big categories are already taken because you're not going to be able to show that you're the first one to have anything like that or to have something which is not obvious in light of the closest thing to it. So, you know, I mean, imagine okay, there have previously not been any web-based polling systems, but people have been doing polling systems through other mediums for a very long time, including telephone polling, et cetera. So they might, if you submitted a patent application that was simply about web polling, then the chances are you get a rejection saying that is obvious because, yeah, okay, maybe there's no direct example of polling being done by web, but here are all these other examples of polling just like this being done through other electronic medium. So therefore it would be obvious or the examiner would conclude at least that it would be obvious to take that existing methodology and just apply it to the web. But then as you get into the details, maybe some of the things you do to have it work well on the web to maybe to anonymize the results or to um, have it be consistent across certain demographics. Maybe those features could be patentable, but then we'd wanna look more specifically at that. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, so yeah, so there's a follow-up question that was asked about the, um, um, the one we were just talking about. Um, if you, um, I, I think he, he's clarifying that if you ask people for their opinion um, about, or idea that we plan to patent later, is it still patentable as we had to put it in the public platform before to gather people's tastes to the idea? Yeah, really good question. Um, and the answer is that if you make it public, then it will become prior art to you. So putting something out there in public um, can be the thing that's used against you in trying to later patent it. But remember in the US, there is a one year grace period exception. And the way that exception works is that, um, you know, if you file your patent application within a year, they can't use that kind of publication that you use to put your idea out in public first. They can't use that directly against you, but only if you were the first person. So if someone else actually, uh, you know, put it out there in public before you, then that would be enough to stop you. You can't use the one year grace period if it's someone else's public disclosure, um, only if it's you. So yeah, technically you could, um, if you, under the right circumstances, you could put it out there um, to test the waters um, and then, um, uh, you could put it out there to test the waters. And then as long as you filed your patent application within a year, that very act of you putting it out there, testing the waters cannot be used against you. But there are other dangers. For example, if um, in between 
someone else kind of took your idea, expanded upon it somewhat, and then filed a patent application, that patent application might still have priority over you. The rules get really complicated and weird. Um, but in general, two things to know about this. Um, you know, one is that you immediately lose the rights in most of the world by putting it out in public, even though there's that one year grace period in the US, most of the world you'd lose your rights. So if you care about foreign rights, then you can't do this, um, this approach at all. Um, you know, the other thing is, is just, it's usually better to apply at least to file a, a well-written provisional before you put it out there in public like that. I mean, um, the middle ground might be getting a, a trusted group of people together on, uh, on the circumstances of confidentiality and, and getting some feedback on portions of the idea and not the full idea. I mean, there's usually things that you can do uh, to, to, to get a feel for whether you're on the right track, but it is always iffy when you put something out in public that you haven't applied for a patent on yet. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. Um, uh, getting close to the end here, but if you have a question, put it in the Q&A pane at the bottom of the, of the screen. Um, again, if you join later, uh, just to let you know, um, don't put any confidential information in the question. Um, this is not for legal advice, this is for educational purposes. So just avoid putting anything in there that reveals what your idea is or something confidential like that. But if you ask the question, it will go directly to me, not seen by the entire group. Um, okay, um, what is a continuation patent application? Um, cool, so a continuation is a patent application that you file later on. So imagine you file your initial patent application um, and then you file another application after that, that claims priority from the first one. So that later application says, um, yes, I'm filing this application and it has a filing date as of today, but look to that other application I filed because um, that was filed, let's say two years ago. And that um, is, that shows my idea or that shows a portion of my idea. And so give me credit for that when you're considering what prior art to use um, against me. Okay. Um, now, um, there's two types of continuation applications. There's a plain old continuation, which is when it's based on the same idea. You're not adding anything new. And there's something called a continuation in part where it's partially the old idea from the old patent that you filed maybe a couple of years ago. And part of it is new idea. Part of it are, um, uh, you know, are new features that you've come up with in the meantime. Um, and so often when this is used is you file your initial patent application, which really covers the main concept. Um, it covers the main invention that you have. But then as you further develop the product, you come up with additional features, which you think are the, themselves worthy of patenting. But you want um, it to be known, you want it to be seen when it's reviewed by the patent office that most of this idea was originally in a patent application that goes back some time. This way, if there was a patent that came out in between that has to do with the, the old part of it, um, then they won't hold that as prior art against you. So that's what a continuation is and a continuation in part. Okay, another question. What are, what are the best step um, to a business plan for a new invention? So the, the, um, the best steps to make a business plan, I, I assume you're, you're saying, um, well, let's consider first that there are different business models for any type of product uh, or service that you're offering. Um, so like often we'll get stuck thinking about one specific type of product. We'll come up with like a new type of, let's say um, like personal vehicle, like a new type of bicycle or scooter. And we'll think like, okay, well, I guess the pathway is to manufacture this product and sell it. So then your business model becomes about manufacturing and then um, selling at a price, you know, selling at a price 
that is, of course, um, greater than the cost that it took to manufacture the, bro- the bike. So you make a profit. It's a, a standard manufacturing and sales model. But you might not consider that another business model for the idea might be to create um, a bunch of, um, of uh, locations that rent the bicycle. So you don't sell it, but you, you rent it by the minute. That could be a, a, a business model for your invention is like a rental model. Um, there could also be a licensing model where you are finding a, a company that wants to use this technology and they pay you a royalty in order to use it. Um, and then even within those different model um, types of businesses or those business models, there's other examples. There's like an infinite number of different models you could pursue. So even like in the manufacturing and sales business model, um, you might be orienting your business to sell directly to consumers. Um, you might be orienting your business to sell directly to bike stores where bike stores are really your customers. You might be um, creating a business where you are selling to, um, to office buildings that then provide these bicycles and a docking station um, at their f- um, front door or um, side entrance or whatever. Um, so there's lots of different business models you can create. I don't know what the best step towards, towards creating the one for your idea is, um, but I would say the best thing is to be flexible. And I've got a great resource. If you're curious about business models, um, there's a book called Business Model Generation by Alex Ostervalda. That's O-S-T-E-R-W-A-L-D-E-R. Um, I guess it's spelled Ostervalder, but he said he pronounced it Ostervalda. So Alex Ostervalda from, um, from Switzerland, he has this great book called Business Model Generation. That's all about seeing the different business models that all the companies around us have created um, to be effective and kind of brainstorming about your own business model. Um, And a cool thing about it too, is he's got this thing called the business model canvas, which is like, it's like a canvas. It's like a poster where you can write the different parts of your business model. And one of the great things that, um, um, you know, one of the great things that uh, it allows you to do is to finally get on the same page with your investors and with your, um, and with your co-founders, where maybe you've been looking at it a little bit differently because you've been talking about it. But once you can actually visualize it and see it, where you've got, okay, well, this is what our customer segment is. It's, um, it's um, people like this. And the value proposition, what we're offering to them is this, a, um, a fun and economical uh, ride to um, their next destination or whatever. And these are our distribution channels. This is our cost structure. These are the, the types of resources we need to develop um, and then you could begin to see it all together in the first place. I've seen it be incredibly valuable for co-founders and investors to, again, get on the same page about all the pieces of the business model. So a little bit of a detour from patents and trademarks, but yes, I, I highly recommend um, Business Model Generation and the Business Model Canvas by um, uh, Alex Ostevalda. And I think his co-author was um, Eve um, Pinure, um, if I'm saying it correctly. Uh, anyway, always got to give credit to the co-author, uh, not just the first guy. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. And actually, I think um, I think it's time to to wrap up here. Um, so a few things. Um, first of all, I did have a question from one of the people on board about whether they can share um, the invitation to this webinar. Um, and the answer is absolutely. Like, go ahead and share them in in your groups. Um, you know, please go ahead and share. You can share the uh, goldsteinpatentlaw.com slash, um, slash OH. So goldsteinpatentlaw.com slash OH. Uh, you know, that will, if they click that link, they'll uh, be able to sign up to get reminders about um, future office actions and uh, office actions, future office hours, and to get on the, um, the webinar next time. And, uh, um, also, if you want to find out if it's a match to work with my team, then um, you go to my website, goldsteinpatentlaw.com, and you can sign up for a consult um, with someone on my team there. Um, and you, there are great um, videos to find out more about the process. You can also, um, if you want to hear more stories about founders and people who have pursued this path of, of innovation with their own products and their own services. I've, I've got this really cool podcast that I've, I've been having a great time doing. It's called 
innovations and breakthroughs. And you can find that on any of the podcast platforms out there. And again, we'll be back here. Uh, I don't know who we is. I mean, I'll be back here next Friday at 12 Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific for office hours if you'd like to join. Um, have a great weekend. And, uh, and really, um, thanks for your questions. Thanks so much for being here. Take care.